comments before we get underway. That number is steadily climbing, and so uh, I think we're we're probably in a in a great place to get started. Uh, thank you to all of those of you who have been so prompt. Want to make the best use of your time. Uh, good evening. My name is Aisha Millette. I'm the uh, president of the National Capital Branch of the Canadian International Council. Uh, we're delighted to have so many of you here. Welcome. Um, as that number climbs, I just wanted to, to pass along that you know we've heard of over. 300 registered participants to tonight's event from over 13 countries and five continents. Uh, it speaks to not only the timeliness of this discussion, but also the appeal of our stellar speakers tonight. We've got a really great lineup for you um, of, of experts to talk about probably one of the most pressing issues of our decade, of our time. Um, I don't think you have to look any further than your own Twitter feed or the front page of the newspaper to know that uh, democracy uh, is under siege. Uh, so looking forward to a really exciting discussion tonight. Before we get underway, I just wanted to take a quick moment to tell those of you who are new to the CIC about the Canadian International Council. We are an organization that's been in place since 1928. There are 19 branches from coast to coast across this country, uh, more than 1,400 members, uh, and the, in the institution has an, a mandate to foster dialogue on pressing foreign policy uh, and global issues. So if you like this kind of thing, if you want more of these discussions, please consider joining the CIC uh, to access uh, some really stellar programming uh, um, you know, in your local area. Um, or just participate in the virtual sessions that the CIC National Capital Branch is hosting as well. Um, I will just take a quick moment to thank all of the volunteers uh, who have helped to put on this event. In particular, I want to thank Margaret Huber, Carolina Shimada, and Emilio uh, Rodriguez for all their hard work in putting this event together. With that, I'll turn over to our uh, stellar moderator as well, uh, without any further ado, uh, Lillian, Sorry, Lillian is uh, on the screen right now. Lillian Thompson is our moderator for this evening. Um, she is uh, probably someone that does need a ton of introduction. She's on the board of the, the CIC National Capital Branch and our director for programming. Uh, she's a fellow at the University of Ottawa Graduate School of Public and International Affairs uh, and comes with a background as a retired diplomat. She has served in Warsaw, in Moscow, in London, and as Consul General in St. Petersburg. Uh, so uh, Lillian, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome to everyone and can't wait to hear this discussion. Thank you very much, Aisha. And I will um, plunge straight ahead into our agenda this evening. We have three wonderful panelists and I will introduce them very briefly. And then my plan is to turn the floor over to each of them in succession in the same order in which I will have introduced them to speak for about five minutes. Um, and then once they have spoken, we will move directly to a question and answer period, which um, I suspect is going to um, <clears throat> gain a lot of interest given the number of people on um, who have registered and uh, have shown up to this evening. So our first speaker will be Jessica Davis. Jessica is the president and principal consultant with Inside Threat Intelligence. She's also the president of the Canadian Association for Security and Intelligence Studies and has written a book called Illicit Money, Financing Terrorism in the 21st Century. She has also, um, prior to her current work, had extensive experience in the Canadian public service, including with the Canadian Forces, Global Affairs Canada, which is our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for those of you who are <laughs> um, joining from outside Canada, FinTrack, which is, um, I guess, best described as an agency for checking on money laundering, and CSIS, which stands for the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. So <clears throat> our second speaker is Sabrina Delhan. Sabrina is the executive director of the Samara Centre for Democracy and is a fellow with uh, Simon Fraser University's Morris J. Wask Centre for Dialogue, and with, she's also with Massey College. And finally, we have Rafael Rohozinski, who is the principal and founder of um, the SecDev Group and Zero Point, Secu Zero Point Security and is a member of the 
national capital branch of the CIC. So this conversation can go literally anywhere and everywhere because you can't escape um, however you receive your news or don't receive your news, uh, being aware of the threats to democracy, misinformation, cyber warfare. Uh, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if someone who did a quantitative study said that it takes up about 10% of the news cycle these days. So I will start with a very general, general question. It's the only one I'm going to ask. Um, what, do, what are your immediate thoughts and what, if anything, can be done? In other words, what's keeping you up at night? Jessica, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so when I think about threats to democracy, uh, I think it's common for people to think about things like state actors or perhaps non-state actors like criminal entities or maybe terrorist groups. What we often miss in this conversation is a financial component for a lot of these threats. In reality, finance underpins a lot of the threat threats to the security of Canada and global security. Threats don't just emerge from anywhere. Threat actors need to identify a course of action, and in many cases, they have to pay others to undertake specific activity. So broadly speaking, we can conceive of this as threat financing, which is my area of specialty. So I want to just take a few minutes to walk through some of the threat financing examples that are keeping me awake at night and explain how they relate to some of the threats to democracy we see today. And of course, how threat financing is increasingly cyber enabled. So let me start with a brief comment on an event that's probably top of mind for many Canadians and particularly for those of us in Ottawa, and that's the Freedom Convoy and the occupation of Ottawa. I conceive of this as having been an extremist event, given the presence of known extremists, separatists, and of course the MOU calling for the overthrow of the government. It also became a criminal event. It was declared unlawful, organizers were charged with a variety of offenses, often relating to things like mischief, and we all know led to the enactment of the Emergencies Act and special economic measures, particularly financial ones, targeting the funds of the convoy organizers. You're probably all familiar with the crowdfunding platforms and the tens of millions of dollars that they purportedly raised for the convoy. I want to clarify something here, though. The vast majority of these funds never made it to the convoy organizers or their participants. Even funds that were released quickly from the crowdfunding platforms were subject to freeze orders almost immediately. The true convoy funding came from other sources, primarily cash, including individual donations, email money transfers, and of course, cryptocurrency donations. In essence, this massive disruptive event was enabled by financial technology, both the email money transfers and cryptocurrency transactions. And this is also true for other kinds of threats to the democracy, to democracy and international security. Anyone who follows me on social media or subscribes to my newsletter knows that terrorists increasingly use cryptocurrency and financial technologies like PayPal or online marketplaces like Amazon or eBay to move money, purchase components for their devices or weapons, et cetera. In some cases, these transactions are actually more traceable because of the online activity. But in others, the use of financial tradecraft can make following the money trail much more challenging. State actors are also no stranger to new financial technologies and they use them for a variety of activities. This includes things like sanctions evasion. Followers of North Korea will know that the country has hacked or sponsored those who have hacked cryptocurrency exchanges. North Korea has also hacked more traditional but cyber enabled financial networks like the SWIFT network, stealing millions of dollars in an effort to acquire currency to fund its weapons of mass destruction program. Russia has also used cryptocurrency to engage in elections interference in the United States. They used Bitcoin to finance part of their hacking operations against the DNC in the 2016 presidential campaign, using funds to purchase things like computer servers, to register domains, and to pay for hacking activities themselves, as well as virtual private networks. While these examples are memorable, a lot of threat finance still happens in the old fashioned way though, through banks and through cash. Some states have also leveraged developments in financial technology space to enhance their surveillance capabilities and increase their ability to control their citizens. For instance, China has been at the forefront of the development of central bank digital currencies, which are essentially digital forms of existing state-backed currencies. But digital currencies go much further in terms of enabling surveillance than traditional currencies or traditional financial systems. Some iterations of this technology can essentially force the creation of a national identity system that might include things like personal data, credit history, financial transactions, and other sensitive information. 
This presents obvious opportunities for intelligence collection and surveillance by states and would remove the existing Financial intelligence like this has a really important role to play in countering illicit finance and can be used for a lot of good in our societies. It provides critical information on for pattern of life and social network analysis and can really assist in threat assessment. But in authoritarian regimes, this also creates the opportunity for states to more effectively and fully surveil their populations with notable op impacts on opposition and protest groups. Combining financial intelligence with other forms of digital information creates a digital author authoritarian state like the one that China's Uyghur population is now experiencing firsthand. And while the Financial Action Task Force, our global norm setter for countering money laundering and terrorist financing, has long trumpeted the creation of financial intelligence units like FinTrack, Canada's that I used to work for, and the exploitation of financial intelligence for counterterrorism and anti-money laundering, the international community has yet to fully grapple with the human rights and privacy impacts of things like financial intelligence and the AML, the anti-money laundering counter-terrorist financing regime writ large. Central bank digital currencies will only further exacerbate this. So I think these examples give you all a taste of what goes into financing threats to democracy and security. There are lots of other examples as well as areas where we just don't have enough information, um, things like financing of mis and disinformation. As you think about threats to the democracy and the rule of law, I'd really ask you to think about what's going on in the background. Financial intelligence related to these threats is often critical in things like attribution and can also be a huge force enabler for disruption efforts. So on that cheery note, I'll uh, turn it back to Lillian and my other panelists. Thank you very much. Um, I think I may have a profound, profound um, think about internet banking. <laughs> so Sabrina, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much in advance. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you to the CIC National Capital Branch for the invitation. It's an honor to be in this group um, and a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Um, the Samara Center is a nonpartisan charitable organization. We work to make our country's democracy more accessible, responsive, and inclusive. And inherent to this work is an understanding that Indigenous laws, systems of governance, and ways of knowing are foundational to what we now understand as Canada's approach to democracy. So with that, I'll share that I'm joining you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I'm joining you here from Toronto as it is colonially known, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So what's keeping me up at night on this topic? Well, our democratic culture is facing urgent and complex challenges related to trust, risk, and knowledge. Online spaces have become the key platforms to engage in political conversation. And this has resulted in online toxicity and misinformation becoming urgent problems of our era. Informed and nuanced solutions need to come from multiple stakeholders that together can appreciate how fluid, diverse, and broad online communication actually is. And this kind of approach is key to evolving past rigid rules or framings that can both compromise free expression and can sometimes miss the mark in terms of corporate accountability. So I feel that a helpful shift can be drawn from the work of advocates like Renee DeResta and Poppy Wood, who are advocating for thinking less about freedom of speech and more about freedom of reach. This gets at how platforms amplify harmful content in a way that is out of proportion to its prevalence in the real world. And this is something we need to be responsive to because it is distorting our public sphere and our social norms. At the Samara Center, we're interested in gathering data that can help us inform solutions to this problem. And we have a particular interest in data that illuminates the lived experience of those navigating toxicity online because we see it as a barrier to civic engagement. It's a key reason for why people leave politics, don't enter politics, or just avoid participating in the political conversation altogether. This is what inspired our Sambot project. Uh, recently, we used a machine learning bot to track toxic tweets received by a selection of candidates in the 2021 federal election. 
In addition to counting the number of tweets, we also analyze the text for toxicity attributes to determine sentiment. In one week alone during the campaign, we captured about half a million tweets aimed at about 300 accounts. 4% of those tweets were sexually explicit. That sounds like a small number, but it translates into approximately 20,000 tweets coming at just a handful of accounts over a few days. 7% of the tweets uh, we tracked that week contained identity attacks. That's 34,000 tweets. Again, just coming at a few accounts over a, over a period of a week. And overall in our tracking uh, during the election, we found that female candidates got more toxicity than their male counterparts, and that content was generally misogynistic and personal. So navigating this torrent of vitriol is a reality on the digital campaign trail. It's what faces candidates and their staffers day in and day out, and that's bound to wear anyone down, including the electorate, who increasingly turn away because of the ugliness in their digital public sphere. And it's very difficult to rebuild that civic connection uh, and that participation in the political conversation and in democracy more broadly once that civic connection is broken. So with Sandbot, we looked at just a small slice of the online political conversation, but the data tells us something important about the state of the online political conversation and the conditions of work for those who are seeking office. Being the target of digital vitriol affects not only who enters politics, but also who stays. Currently, we're using Sandbot to monitor toxicity in the Ontario election. And we'll be sharing weekly snapshots throughout the campaign and an in-depth report on our federal election findings is forthcoming. Um, and in terms of what's next for democracy and Canada's role in the world, online toxicity is an urgent matter. Failure to respond and risks further degradation to the political discourse and people turning their backs on the democratic process. Projects like Sambot can help um, by demonstrating an approach for how AI-driven tools can be used to advance our civic inquiry in an ethical and productive manner. And this kind of work is also aimed at creating informed solutions that can help to restore the pro-democracy aspects of social media platforms and also evolve our democracy to be better equipped for the digital age. Thank you. I thought your use of the phrase of freedom of reach was particularly um, interesting and gave me pause. Of course, the last, last what, 10 days or so has seen Elon Musk purchase Twitter, um, assuming all the I's are dotted and T, T's are crossed and today, um, a statement I gather to the effect that he is going to let Mr. Trump back on, on the platform. So yes, um, depressing. Um, before I pass the floor to Rafael, I'll just say for those of you who know, who live in Ottawa, um, we of course had the, the, the convoys and blockages in the month of January and into February. And Rafael for his, his sins is now the uh, <laughs> acting uh, chief information officer for the city of Ottawa, where of course um, a very massive wash up and lessons learned um, exercise is ongoing. So Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, very, very pleased to be partaking in this, uh, this uh, seminar this evening on a topic, which I think, you know, is, is as you said, dominating the news cycle as well. Um, a few words about, about what I, the organization I lead, besides the, the work I do with the City of Ottawa, which is the Chief Information Security Officer, which is an interesting S before information. Um, SecDev is, is really believed uh, that knowledge is empowerment. And, and for the last 20 years, we've worked to develop a ethical public health approach to be able to leverage human, machine, and artificial intelligence in order to be able to understand the kinds of transformations that information, information infrastructures make on the civil policy, not just here in Canada, but abroad. Um, we've helped the UN monitor for digital harms and digital transformation in over 30 countries. We've worked with the US and the Canadian Ministries of Defense, uh, specifically on violent extremism. Um, and we've worked with corporations that are trying to understand how changing attitudes uh, towards things like climate change and environment um, are impacting on, on consumer news. So that understanding is really, really important because I think as Sabrina pointed out, at the end of the day, democracy is based on trust. And so is the digital infrastructure upon which our democracy is built. 
And Lillian, if the, if the last you know, news cycle has been dominated by the sort of disruption in the civic policy that we've seen through the occupation of Ottawa, uh, for example, um, the other 90%, at least in the last two months, has been dominated by the war in Ukraine. And the war in Ukraine actually has some very fundamental impacts on the kinds of transformations and debates that we've seen around the use of technology and its impact on democracy going back several years, because it's really changed the landscape in a rather drastic way, and in a drastic way which we have yet to quite uh, grasp with. Um, first of all, you know, prior to the 24th of February 2022, we had a concept of what criminality, malfeasance, and warfare in cyberspace would look like. Um, but that image of what we thought it was changed in the face of the reality that be, became. So whereas we thought, hypothesized, that cyber war would be this war of systems against systems principally fought out in core, we now have a very different kind of cyber war where that malware level, if you like, still exists, but other levels have come to the forefront. First of all, we've seen infrastructure deliberately targeted at a massive scale um, out of proportion with its actual uh, impact within the theater of operations. For example, if you read the newspaper in the last few days, or last few weeks, uh, you will have seen that Russia launched a massive cyber attack against the um, satellite-based communication systems that were used in Ukraine. Uh, not only did this attack knock most of those satellite systems offline in Ukraine, but it also crippled satellite communications across most of Europe. In other words, well outside of the theater of war. Um, we've also seen the weaponization of uh, technology platforms. And this isn't just the Facebooks and the TikToks through which the Ukrainians have fought a very successful information war against uh, the, the Russians, but we've also seen cloud providers such as Amazon or services available online weaponized in ways uh, where the licensing has been denied to Russia and allied countries, essentially degrading or, or crippling aspects of their economy in ways that, that simply hadn't been seen before. We've seen the rise of military cyber, which most people don't talk about and haven't talked about for good reason, but which has become a very major element in the way that the Ukrainians, being a much smaller, much more mobile force, have managed not only to defend against a much larger invading Russian army, um, but actually successfully recapture territory. We've seen economic sanctions and economic warfare now take the front uh, foot, especially in its digital dimensions. I mentioned already sanctions that have acted to deprive uh, Russian companies and the Russian government for access to digital resources, but we've also actually seen the withdrawing of the internet services, um, significant internet services, and the use of, for example, um, data that's available through geospatial platforms like Google Earth and others, now being made um, a real factor in the way that targeting occurs uh, within the war itself. Um, why all this matters is because everything I've def defined here could be put into a narrative, well, it's, it's part of the way that we are defending Ukraine's democracy. But I'll give you the flip inverse side of this, which is also really important to consider and which gets at this issue of trust. In the last 77 days, we've also thrown out pretty well every global norm that we've tried to establish about behavior in cyberspace. For example, our condoning of crowdsourced cyber attacks against Russian government, Russian banks, Russian institutions may seem like just retribution for their illegal occupation and invasion of Ukraine. But essentially what it means is that the norms that we negotiated through the UN GGE process for the last 15 years no longer apply. And maybe in the last 77 days, there's a virtuous reason why we've permitted this. But essentially, by permitting it there, we've also permitted it elsewhere. And that rewriting of conventions or normalizing effectively a wartime footing to cyberspace comes at the core of what this may mean for our democracy going forward. Because at the end of the day, our current democracy, as we've seen, is built upon a digital foundation, a digital foundation which is incredibly vulnerable to manipulation whether that manipulation is through the weaponization of platforms, the weaponization of, uh, of, of finance, or whether it's through direct attacks in order to undermine it at the level of integrity and infrastructure. And that is something that we all have to worry about. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, um, all descending to a lower level in, in, in many respects, which is um, 
sadly not going to come to an end anytime soon, I, I, I don't think. Uh, to start the questions, um, this is a, a Canadian government policy focused question for all three of you, if you, if you like. Of course, we had a budget in April and Margaret Huber, who of course worked very closely with you to structure this um, seminar, is asking, did the budget provisions go far enough? Could more, should more have been done? So uh, welcome answers beginning with Jessica. <clears throat> Mm, thank you for that. That's um, it's a bit of an interesting one. So there is a lot of talk in the budget about um, a number of different elements related to my area of expertise. So FinTrack gets um, a big budget increase. There's um, the crowdfunding websites have now become regulated. That was sort of made official in, in the budget. The piece that really struck me, though, in the budget was um, efforts to establish a financial crime agency. So we knew this from the Liberals in their campaign that this is something that they wanted to do. And the budget itself um, laid out, basically they, they, are, they said that they were gonna make a plan to make a plan in terms of the financial crime agency. To a certain extent, it's, it's good to see this, but the problem for me is that it's so overdue. Um, you know, we're not good at fighting financial crime at large. We're not good at sanctions enforcement in this country. You know, we've sanctioned uh, dozens of Russian entities since the war started, but actually investigating and enforcing potential sanctions evasion activity is very minimal in Canada. And I think that's a big problem. So we have all these regulations and all the, these laws, but who's actually enforcing them? Um, so the financial crime agency, I pin a lot of hope on that. I think right now we don't have a lot of details in terms of what it's going to do and how it's going to be structured. Um, so it's not far enough and it's not soon enough in my opinion. Okay, Sabrina, do you have some thoughts? Well, at the Zamora Center, we're, we're very aware of the learning loss that has happened as we are coming out of the pandemic and we see that as a major civic loss. And for us, we're very interested in funding that takes a generational approach to building democratic capability. Um, and that's something we would like to see in terms of an investment is in youth civic literacy. And, and what's relevant to our conversation today in particular is the need for a national media literacy strategy. Um, and it would be wonderful to see support for that. Um, we know that social media is a key way for young pe people to demonstrate active citizenship, but it can also be a place that um, results in exposure to extremist thinking, radicalization, uh, and there's a lot that we need to do as a country in order to, to bolster our youth civic literacy and um, funding on that front is a critical way forward and it would have been nice to see something more in that vein uh, with this budget. Rafael, do you have any comments? Uh, I'll say something controversial. Um, I think the budget is actually the problem rather than the solution. And I'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean by this. Um, Canada doesn't have a culture of having a centralized body that deals with issues that are of national importance or of national security. We don't have the equivalent of a cabinet office like they have in the UK. We don't have the equivalent of a national security council. So very often what budgets end up being essentially are buckets of money that are thrown to a department to solve a problem that requires a whole of government approach. Um, those of you who have followed you know, the development of Canada's cybersecurity policy, for example, yeah, will note that it differs very, very you know, significantly from that of the US, UK or other peer countries in the sense that it is buried within Public Safety Canada. And ultimately, at the end of the day, has very little resonance or there's very little reason why other departments really pay attention to it, except for the fact that they may receive some marginal service from it. Um, the same will go for, for issues like digital citizenship. I mean, look, digital citizenship, which really lies at the problem of the way that civics are being transformed by a combination of technology, generational change, and globalized pressures, isn't something that can be handled by one department through a budget line. It's something that requires coordination across multiple government departments, as well as federal and provincial coordination. And I think that's the problem. There's a lack of a vision that actually sees this as something of, of requiring a whole of government approach and the lack of a whole of government mechanism that should be funded through a budget that really contributes to the perpetuation of trying to fight a forest fire by basically throwing small buckets of water on pockets of flames. 
think are very inter in, in, inter interesting thoughts. Um, I have a number of questions now on, on the Sandbox um, project. Just a second here. Um, from Lewis Auerbach, on the Sandbox project, how do you identify tweets against the candidate actually organized by the candidate herself or himself designed to create the impression that opponents are engaged in degrading cyber warfare and don't deserve support? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, uh, in our monitoring, we can see if there's coordination in terms of the time that the tweet is posted, and we can tell if it's a coordinated distribution of content through bots, because we would be able to tell from the scale and volume if it's thousands of tweets sent within five minutes. That's not something a human being would be able to do. Um, and we can also tell if it's a matter of um, a more human-centered campaign to copy and paste uh, material during a certain period of time. So there's uh, clues and indicators that we can um, that we have available to us that can that can give us a sense of how coordinated is this material? Um, is it the same content uh, being appearing more than once? I'm not. It's an interesting question that someone would try to self sabotage in an attempt to get sympathy. And um, it's a very cynical and sad question, but I understand why it's being asked. Um, it's not something that we we were uh, figuring in our analysis. We were focused more on the, the volume and the intensity of the toxicity. Um, but that's something for us to bear in mind as we turn to tracking the Ontario election. Yeah, thank you. A follow-up question from Marv Chappelle. You've identified, Sabrina, you've identified the potential toxic ills of social media. What solutions would you propose that do not seriously erode our freedom of speech? Sure. So one thing with our federal election is that we were able to use data from the Library of Parliament to track uh, specific variables related to the candidates their A or their gender rather, which was binary, uh, their writing and other details like that. And we would have been able to have a much more nuanced story about the experience on the digital campaign trail if we had had access to demographic data that had been collected and shared with consent. Um, and that would give us a better sense of how, who gets the most toxicity under what conditions and circumstances, and then how does that longer term affect how long someone stays within the political arena. Another way to mitigate the toxicity would be for the electorate to raise their expectations of political parties and how they're responding to this toxicity. They often require their candidates to be on these social media platforms. So what resources and supports are being made available to candidates to ensure that they feel safe uh, when they are working online. There's also things to consider, like can you block one of your own constituents if they're sending vitriol your way? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the norms and understandings around that, just in terms of having a safe workspace? And then we're also looking to, ha uh, to how there can be a culture change in how online harm is understood and addressed. Is this something that um, are there solutions here that are centering the survivor of this of this um, harm? If we're going to be regulating and having policy-based solutions like this, we also need to bear in mind a cultural change in terms of validating that online harm is harm. Sometimes there can be a disconnect there between online and, and offline harm. And also um, just understanding that this truly is a major problem. And, and in our work on Sandbot, we got a lot of engagement from the media, from journalists and the broader political community who felt that our work to quantify this very small slice of the political conversation was very validating and legitimizing for them. Because when we just hear about technology's influence on democratic culture or online toxicity, it sounds vague and, and broad but this helped to make it real. So I think those are some of the ways that um, we can look to mitigate the toxicity online. A lot of it is about having access to even more data and also having a, a cultural shift in how we approach this problem. Thank you. 
I've now had a number of questions about Rafael's comments, asking the other panelists to comment on Rafael's comments. I'll read out the question and um, give uh, Jessica and Sabrina a, an opportunity to make comments and then invite Rafael to make comments on the comments, if that sounds, <laughs> sounds like a fair way, of, fair way of proceeding. So the question from Rod Do Dobell is, could the panel elaborate in Rafael's comments about the surprising violations of established norms and rules governing cyberspace and the adverse consequences thereof. I will let Jessica get take first crack at that. <laughs> it's a little outside of my area of expertise, so I'll uh, I'll cede my time to Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, my, my interpretation or take uh, on what Raphael was sharing there was the complexity of these problems and how they intersect with other areas. And I think that's also connected to the culture shift comment that I made before. Complex problems don't ha happen in isolated little spots that you can just target with funding or action or um, some other type of response, all of this, this, this feeling that we have right now, this, this sense of democratic backsliding, this uh, uh, erosion of our norms, this feeling of unease, it's not something that, it just, that just exists in one area or domain of our life. Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen boundaries blurred between work and home, personal, private, and all of that is very disruptive. And so I think if we're looking to develop solutions to complex problems, and we also need to be thinking across all of those different boundaries as well. And that's really uncomfortable and difficult. Um, but I think that's part of uh, evolving our democracy to be prepared for the 21st century, uh, which began 22 years ago. And so we're, we're desperately working hard on that right now. And I think it's good to name the discomfort and complexity of of everything and, and for us to come to terms with the fact that solutions don't just exist in perfect clean boxes and that we need a lot of diverse perspectives and problem solvers to move ahead. Thank you. Rafael, would you like to comment on the comment? Sure. Well, may, maybe what I can introduce is a little bit of historical perspective here. And that is, you know, the, the, the kinds of challenges to our democracy, which includes both internal challenges of, of voices that go outside of what's a lot of us would concern to be civility, um, as well as the potential for others outside of sovereign Canadian territory to interfere in, in elections. It's nothing new. It's new to us. But the emergence of the internet back in the 1990s was something that actually struck a lot of other countries for whom it wasn't an organic, we own the internet and therefore it's gonna benefit us, but rather saw it as a kind of a colonial exercise by mostly Western and US companies. Um, as something that they raised. And in fact, it was China and the Russian Federation, which within the context of the United Nations back in the late 1990s, through the governmental group of experts, raised a number of questions around whether cyberspace should have national sovereignty or whether this multi-stakeholder approach that we take to its governance is the one that should prevail, whether or not there should be consequences for countries that interfere in the information space on others. And this debate between two blocks, you know, what's known as the like-minded, which is the demographic, demographic block, the sort of G20 countries, and then other countries represented largely by Russia and China, debated over what would be the minimal accepted number of rules that everybody would be willing to follow. One of these rules was that civilian infrastructure should not be targeted by deliberate cyber attack in times of war. That's one rule that in the last 77 days we've seen broken. So effectively, 15 years of trying to come up with common rules that we could somehow agree upon internationally, minimum rules, have now gone out the window, which means that any of the debates that may have consequences for us, like foreign interference in Canadian cyberspace, like economic interests that may be represented through political means, like the broadening of civility or incivility in cyberspace, suddenly have put us into unknown territory that we have to go through. And, and why this is important, maybe, you know, is in the context of something I think Jessica or, or Sabrina said earlier, you know, cyberspace has really transformed the way that civic life happens. 
And if we look back to the last time that this occurred and the kinds of com consequences it has, this was you know, during the Gutenberg revolution. You know, Gutenberg essentially made the word of God uh, accessible in the vernacular to the populace. And that was one of the things that's always held up, that the Bible became readable by people. What many people don't realize is that the second most popular book that was printed on Gutenberg's presses was something called Maleus Maleficarum, or the Book of Witches, which essentially was a guidebook to the prosecution of women, witches, and which led to tremendous bloodshed and discord in, in that time Europe. So in the same way, we can say, you know, the internet may have opened up and made knowledge the vernacular for humanity, but social media and platforms and the way that they're used is the equivalent of the book of witches of our age, which we're gonna to have to deal with. Hmm. Well, the next question um, pays tribute to the diagnostics, but carries your thoughts, Raphael, just now somewhat further. So misinformation, disinformation, and unfounded con conspiracy theor theories are existential threat to the fabric of Canadian democracy and to public trust in its institutions but not one the state can, or perhaps even should, completely counter. So what, op what are the options that also respect the very discourse that is critical to democracy? That's an easy question. Um, Jessica, would you like to take, even from the, it's applicable to everything, including the financial perspective, would you like to take a first crack? Yeah, absolutely, and I think, I was really struck by something that Sabrina said earlier in terms of um, media literacy being a fundamental piece of, of this. And I'll tell you a little story about why I think it's so important. So as many people in the audience will remember, um, back in 2020, there was a mass shooting incident in Nova Scotia. Um, it was a tragic event. There was a lot of things that went very, very wrong during that uh, incident. One of the things that came out after the fact was a, a story from Mac McLean's magazine, a very reputable uh, news magazine here in Canada, suggesting that the shooter was actually an RCMP informant or source. Um, they had a little bit of expert opinion supporting this idea, um, but no actual evidence. So what ended up happening with the story is now it's, it's come out that this is not true. This was a completely unfounded assertion. Um, the experts that the, the, the story quoted um, got it wrong, got it very wrong. But what ended up happening is that a well-known Canadian extremist used this story to basically catapult himself to internet stardom um, and really grow his following and use this whole, whole idea of mistrust of government to grow his extremist platform. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I, I see, you know, media literacy and, and a very close read of this article demonstrates that, you know, McLean's didn't come out and say that he was a, he was a source or, or informant. They hinted around it. And if you read it carefully, you got that. But if you didn't read it carefully, you just saw sort of the headline that he could have been and, and the conclusions that a lot of people drew from that is that he was. Hmm. Sabrina, would you like to offer your thoughts? You're muted, I'm afraid. Sorry, just to build on what Jessica was saying, you know, we are coming out of a period of physical isolation and, and social alienation with the public health measures that have been in place because of the pandemic. And because of these conditions and circumstances, which people have adhered to uh, out of a sense of responsible citizenship, uh, people have spent more time online and with more users on digital platforms, experts have, um, have found that the amount of hate speech and offensive content has increased exponentially. But in contrast, um, or related, youth who have been online uh, during the pandemic that have engaged in social media activity uh, to civic ends, whether that's um, organizing some sort of uh, online protest or sharing political content have, uh, have fared better in terms of mental health outcomes. But then there's also still the risk, as I mentioned earlier, about their exposure uh, to radicalization or, or uh, extremist ends. So just to underscore again, the complexity and nuance of, of what we're looking at here, there is, and as Raphael noted as well, right? There's so much potential and knowledge and wonder and insight and connection to be gained from uh, 
from the internet, from the digital world, but then there's all these cautions and concerns and, and um, elements that are so harmful in ways that we're only really truly beginning to understand. And it's like, we're trying to catch up with it. And inherent to this is a perception in the mainstream that somehow technology is pure. And so we should just trust the technology or technology's okay or, um, but we have to understand humans create technology. Humans are the ones who use technology. Humans are the ones that guide technology. And um, that's part of what we are looking to uh, explore with our use of Sandbot. We're a civil society organization. We partnered with a startup company uh, to use a bot to advance civic inquiry. And we were very transparent about the manner in which we did that. So there's something to be said here about the different types of collaborations or partnerships or approaches that we need to take to solve these kinds of complex problems. Um, and that the way we approach technology in the first instance has to be uh, open, but also very critical as well as we're exploring today. Rachel, would you like to add some comments? Yeah, well, as, as Mark Twain once said, you know, history doesn't repeat and it's, but it rhymes. Uh, and in this case, you know, I think that the past is sometimes the prologue to the future. So, you know, when, when automobiles were first introduced into the, uh, the highways and byways of, of what then was Great Britain, um, who was responsible for setting road signs and standards? It was the automobile owners and the automobile associations because it was only felt that they had their sufficient expertise to put in place the rules necessary to use cars. Now, flash forward 100 years, who would expect the CAI to be setting rules on highways and, and behavior of drive, issuing driver's license? No one. Because civic standards changed, because it became recognized that roadways and automobiles were a part of fabric of society that needed a careful balance between rights and responsibilities. I think the challenge that we're having with digital space is that we're still in the age of effectively the associations of internet providers, the technology platforms, setting the rules for our civic behavior. There is no balance between right and responsibility. You know, Sam Duke, who, who wrote here on, on in the question and answer, you know, asked the question, um, you know, regardless of one's opinions about the truckers' protests, what are your thoughts about the precedents established by the Emergency Measures Act and its possible consequences for freedom of speech and, and, and activity in Canada? And I think he asks a really good question, because on one level, it's sad that we needed to have the Emergency Measures Act put in place in order to solve something which is a fundamental question all of us should have been asking in the last digit, a decade. And that is, what is it to be a Canadian citizen in the digital age? What rights and responsibilities does it entail? How do we create a balance between that? And whether you are sympathetic with the truckers or not sympathetic with the truckers, it doesn't really matter because the essential question really comes down to what is the essence of our democracy, recognizing that it's now going to be lived in these new circumstances where financing is global, where freedom of speech is in some way unbridled and where we don't have normal limits and controls on it that make this balance between rights and responsibilities. And why that's important, and I think Sabrina got at it, is because that's the level at which we need to be engaging our children in terms of what civics are going to be. That right now, the way we think of civics is massively outdated, given the kind of reality in which they live in. And if we want to avoid the kind of social schisms that we had through the truckers, we got to get at the question of what is Canadian citizenship in the digital era? That's the essence of it. Very, very, very good. And I see nodding heads, um, comments, sort of segueing towards the end of our hour and keeping on that same general theme, uh, two questions which follow on logically. One uh, by from Nathaniel Black, a student at, at Ottawa U, asking with reference by way of an example to the current Ontario election campaign, is there a role for something akin to Elections Canada, if there's a body called Elections Ontario, I'm not sure, um, in um, the regulation of social media campaign, social media campaigns in the context of, a, of an election? And a second, second question from, from um, Kendra Aben, um, should we be looking at disconnecting or severely limit, limiting the internet? So two, one bigger question than the other, but both dealing with the question of regulation and um, control of social media stroke the internet. So Jessica, do you wanna 
take first crack? Sure. I, I definitely don't think that we should be disconnecting the internet or significantly limiting it. I think what we need instead is a bit more of a realistic assessment of, of some of the harms, certainly um, balancing that with some of the very strong positives that come from it. And like, we can, we can think about this too, in the context of like even crowdfunding, you know, obviously it got a lot of really bad press during the trucker convoy, but the vast majority of crowdfunding campaigns serve a public good. Um, you know, they're supporting charities, they're supporting um, in the United States, particularly the payment of medical expenses. Um, the, the biggest crowdfunding campaign that occurred in Canada was uh, in support of the Humboldt bus uh, tragedy. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of really positive things that come from that. On the other hand, though, and to draw this into sort of the elections and foreign interference and foreign influence question, it also means that there's a lot of money and influence coming into Canada from outside our border. So I think we really need to think about modernizing some <coughs> of the way that we think about that, whether or not we think that it's all right for um, potentially foreign individuals or foreign interests to be funding protest in Canada. Um, we've already said that it's not okay for them to fund election campaigns specifically, but I think we need to broaden out some of the way we think about that. So Sabrina, would you like to? Um, sure, there, there is in fact an Elections Ontario, um, so I can put a link to that in the chat for everybody. Um, I think it's a good question about who who is tasked with this. What authoritative institution, uh, nonpartisan, is tasked with ensuring that everything is above board with our elections, with social media content? And this gets at what uh, Raphael was saying as well, which is we're we're quite behind. There's a lot that needs to evolve in terms of our, of our agencies, in terms of how we approach. Uh, civic onboarding in Canada? Do we have a generational approach to this? Um, and how can we advance a digital reset so that we are sufficiently equipped and resourced and uh, enabled to be effective and productive um, carrying out practicing democracy in the digital age? So those are good questions about who's regulating and who's monitoring and how do we formalize that? And I think right now we're in a period where organizations and agencies are working hard to maintain their, um, their relevance and significance because they're desperately needed, but they need to evolve and there needs to be help and support to bring that forth. Thank you, Rafal. Yeah, I think it's important to be able to distinguish between norms and rules. Uh, for, the large, for the most part, you know, if we take a look at what the Elections Act currently covers, or for example, what CRTC covers um, on the media side, we already have norms that are embedded in institutions that can cover many of what we see as sort of digital excesses or digital harms. The problem is that we haven't really applied them, or we haven't thought how they should be applied within the context of a changed situation. So that, that's you know, something which I think we have difficulty with. And it comes back to you know, the, the, the issue that as a government, first of all, we don't have a cabinet level perspective on being able to deal with whole of government or whole of society issues easily, which means that it takes a lot to create a norm and even more to actually create an institution or capability to be able to deal with it. And on the capability side, look, you know, the reality is this, there's been such a transformation that it's been caused by the digital domain in, in all aspects of life. And we've only touched on some of them in this discussion that it seems rather bizarre that we only have a few pinpricks within the public sector that are actually responsible for it or create capabilities for it. Um, you know, the Canada Center for Cybersecurity is great, fantastic, but it's an offshoot appendage of CSE with a limited mandate in terms of what it can do. Contrast that to the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK or the tremendous effort being put in in the US both within government as well as associated institutions to protect the integrity of elections, for example. And we fall far, far behind. You know, as Canadians, we have to recognize that it's up to us to define what it is to be Canadian in the digital age and then push for changed norms and then push for appropriate institutions. There's a sequence to these things that, that, that has to be taken. And unfortunately, we're just not there yet. Thank you. So as I said at the outset, my firm conviction is the, is, is the moderator should um, not speak very much, but we're reaching the five minute point um, before the end of this, this seminar. And 
I think it is safe to say that the CIC and many other organizations be coming back to these questions which have been discussed and these issues in the months and the years to come. There are a lot of signposts out there beginning, but not limited to, let's say, the US midterm elections later this year. The whole questions about institutions to, to deal with social media, cyber threats, et cetera, um, the training and recruitment of, of, of uh, people with the capabilities, the civics piece. So given that this subject will be coming, these subjects, I should probably say, will be coming back at us uh, in the months and years to come. Could I ask each of you to give us two thoughts that you'd like to live in our, leave in our heads as we start to think about the next time we get together to talk about these issues? And Jessica, I'm afraid I'm going to be very unfair <laughs> and ask you to go first. Sure, I think I'll echo some of my comments that I started with, and that's to think about some of the underlying factors when we think about threats to democracy and threats to security, um, and to think not just about where the threats are emanating from, but how they're getting here and how they're being enabled. Obviously, my focus on that is going to be on the financial piece, but there's lots of other elements that we can be thinking about there as well. Um, and I would definitely agree with the comments of my fellow panelists, uh, Rafael's comments about um, the lack of centralized coordinating sort of national security infrastructure is well taken. I think that we have some coordinating mechanisms that work kind of okay, um, but we have a lot of challenges in terms of coordination and making sure that, you know, we're, that we're updating our national security legislation and infrastructure on a regular basis, not just in response to a crisis like the trucker convoy and the regulation of crowdfunding platforms that came from that, but in a proactive way, because at the moment we seem to be really lagging on a lot of these threats. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina. Well, I'd like to close with a bit of hope. The majority of people in Canada are reasonable. They've been observing public health protocols during the pandemic. They value their democracy and the majority are also concerned about the anger that's radiating off of the online political conversation. And I think as we start to emerge from the pandemic, we have a really important opportunity to make a big uh, transformational change in how we strengthen democracy in Canada and the ways we uh, approach uh, solutions to these complex problems. Nice optimistic note. Rafael? Well, two thoughts. So, so first, harking back to a, a cartoon from the 1930s featuring a, a figure named Pogo, in which he says reflectively, we have met the enemy and it is us. Um, and many of the times when we talk about threats to democracy, it's easy to externalize it and say, well, it's because of this or it's because of that without really looking at ourselves and saying, well, maybe we have a role here in terms of defining some of these questions around what we see as being acceptable, what it is you know, to be Canadian, what are our roles and responsibilities of, of changing citizenship. And, and I think that's a crucial point that, that frankly all of us have to take away because at the end of the day, that's who, you know, look in the mirror, you're the agent of change and, and without you, this isn't gonna happen. The other, I think, takeaway I would say is this, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's easy to be able to point to the last three years of, of chaos, confusion, fear, and say that this is the norm that now is undermining our fundamental democratic principles without really recognizing the fact that the digital age has also led to a kind of empowerment of individuals that we just haven't seen before. The fact that individuals can make a difference, whether it's in the environment, whether it's on single rights, whether it's on anything else uh, in terms of making a movement, and to be able to give that movement teeth through financing, through voice, is really quite revolutionary. There's a lot of positive that has come with this. The challenge is that that positiveness is happening in an unconstrained manner where we still haven't figured out the balance between where civility, roles, and responsibilities really lie. Thank you very much. And a warm thank you to all three of you, Jessica, Sabrina, and Rafael from um, our over 100, well, 116 remaining participants. This has been really interesting. We looked forward to following up um, on the conversation. And on behalf of the CIC's National Capital Branch, thank you very much and have a good evening. Enjoy the, the temperate weather. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Goodbye.